day of the conference. I hope that, that everyone has enjoyed the program so far, including the content and most importantly, the opportunity to see colleagues from throughout the industry in person again. We have a range of exciting conversations planned for today, including panel discussions on central bank digital currencies, digital assets, cross-border payments, climate change, enforcement issues, who gets access to the payment system, state of privacy, and cyber threats, among others. As everyone in the room knows, these issues are indeed meaningful for financial institutions, for consumers, and for the financial system more broadly, which makes the role of this morning's keynote speaker extremely relevant. So along these lines, it is my pleasure to introduce Acting Comptroller Mike Sue this morning. By way of brief background, Mike Sue became Acting Comptroller on May 10th of 2022 upon his designation by Secretary Yellen as first Deputy Comptroller. He brings a wealth of experience to this role, including through having served as Director of the Division of Supervision and Regulation at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, a role in which he chaired the Large Institution Supervision Coordinating Committee Operating Committee. His career has additionally included serving as a financial sector expert at the International Monetary Fund, financial economist at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, where he helped to establish the Troubled Assets Relief Program, as a financial economist at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Without a doubt, Acting Comptroller Sue has come to the helm of the OCC at a time when there is no shortage of important and complex issues facing the financial sector and the agency, and any number of which we are each and ideally together working to address in a productive way. And so we are indeed fortunate to have someone as skilled and knowledgeable as Mike Sue in this role to address these issues in a way that contributes to the ongoing health of the financial system. Acting Comptroller Sue, we appreciate your being in the role and your presence here today to share the OCC's perspective on a range of issues. Following remarks, uh, Acting Comptroller Sue will take your questions, uh, so please submit them through the app. He will be seated over here, and uh, uh, we will read, uh, read your questions out, uh, and he will take them following his remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Acting Comptroller Michael Sue. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this year's TCHBI annual conference. Uh, I understand uh, there was a hot breakfast this morning to for all people, and so thank you for, for, for that. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to participate in an event that covers such a wide ranging uh, set of topics, as uh, Robin pointed out, and brings together such a distinguished group. <coughs> Last year, I spoke of the importance of safeguarding trust in banking. I noted that my key priorities for the agency, guarding against complacency, addressing inequality, adapting to digitalization, and managing climate-related risk, reflect what I see as the key long-term threats to trust in banking. With an eventful year having passed, I'd like to take a few moments today to provide an update on each priority, starting with digitalization. Like many industries, banking is being digitalized. At a high level, this is occurring through the expansion of tech firms into financial services, and to a lesser degree, the hyping growth of the crypto industry. While crypto has grabbed the headlines for most of the past year, I believe fintechs and big techs are having a larger impact and are much more of our attention. But let me start with crypto. Before my appointment as acting comptroller, the OCC had issued several interpretive letters that gave national banks and federal savings associations a green light to engage in crypto. I had a different perspective. We saw red flags in crypto's rapid growth. Under my direction, the OCC had adopted a careful and cautious approach. The agency put into place this approach through the issuance of Interpretive Letter 1179, which establishes guardrails by clarifying that national banks should not engage in certain crypto activities unless they demonstrate that the activities can be performed in a safe, sound, and fair manner. National banks must obtain a supervisor non object in writing before beginning certain new crypto activities. <coughs> this process prevents them from engaging in these activities without first adopting appropriate risk management capabilities. The FDIC and Fed later issued similar letters to supervise banking organizations, helping to ensure a lot of The terror stablecoin collapse in May, among other factors, 
spark contagion across cryptocurrencies more broadly, resulting in several uh, crypto platforms failing, forcing numerous exchanges to close, and driving large losses and reductions of staff at a number of companies. The repercussions are still being felt today in the crypto space. The banking system, by contrast, has largely been unaffected. I believe this is due, at least in part, to the careful and cautious approach that we adopted and intend to maintain for the foreseeable future. Now let me turn towards uh, uh, banks and fintechs. As all of you know, banking continues to march steadily towards taking place online, on mobile devices, and in the cloud. Similar to other industries, banking services, which used to be integrated and largely contained within the banking industry, are being compartmentalized and offered by a greater number of entities beyond traditional banks, including by technology firms. These developments are creating an increasingly varied and complex set of arrangements, which are significantly more intricate than the standard bank outsourcing relationships of yesteryear. The growth of the fintech industry of banking as a service, or BAS, and the big tech forays into payments and lending is changing banking and its risk profile in profound ways. I analogize these changes to the globalization of manufacturing that started in the 1980s. What began as outsourcing evolved over time into a system of highly specialized companies linked by hyper-efficient and complex supply chains. While this evolution generally resulted in lower prices for consumers, recent events have highlighted the vulnerabilities of such a system to disruptions. Banking is undergoing a similar transition today. Digitalization has put a premium on online and mobile engagement, customer acquisition, customization, big data, fraud detection, AI, ML, and cloud. These activities require expertise and economies of scale that most banks do not have. FinTechs and big techs have stepped in, starting with banks, but expanding well beyond that. The result is an increasingly de-integrated stack of banking services, with tech firms competing across many layers. Some data points may help illustrate what the future holds. I recently asked my team to quickly profile banks with multiple BAS partnerships. They identified at least 10 OCC-regulated banks that have BAS partnerships with nearly 50 fintechs. Using public information, they also identified similar arrangements of banks regulated by the Fed and FDIC. Notably, this is not a large bank issue. The vast majority of banks identified have total assets below $10 billion. Nearly a fifth have total assets less than $1 billion. The pressure to partner is not only coming from the bank side, but from fintechs as well. Valuations in the fintech space have fallen significantly. As a result, prophecies of fintechs disrupting banks out of existence have largely been replaced with a focus on building partnerships. By partnering, banks can gain speed to market and access to tech innovation at lower costs. While fintechs seek to benefit from banks' reputation for being trustworthy, long-standing customer bases and access to cheaper capital and funding sources. As a result, bank fintech partnerships have been growing at exponential rates and gotten more complicated. Bank and tech firms, in an effort to provide a seamless customer experience, are teaming up in ways that make it more difficult for customers, regulators, and the industry to distinguish between where the bank stops and where the tech firm starts. Where is all this headed? For me, there's an added familiarity. You know, in the 2008 financial crisis, I recall being camped out at New York Fed and seeing for the first time a wall-sized map of the shadow banking system uh, that had been put together by Zoltan Kozar and Adam Ashraf. From afar, it looked like a circuit diagram, lots of boxes and lines. But if you look closely, you can see key accounts of assets, liabilities, and equity connected to each other in really complex ways. Money market funds buying liabilities from ABC conduits, buying CP from SIVs, buying CEOs, buying other CEOs. The light bulb moment for me was realizing that the plethora of Fed 33 facilities that were being established to prevent the financial system from melting down were backstopping each component of this complex system. A system that had evolved to approximate and compete with the traditional banking system and was then in the ground. In other words, the discount window, the government's liquidity backstop for banks, had to be synthetically created to match the complexity of the modern financial system. My concern today is that a similar increase in complexity is happening with regards to online and mobile payments, lending, and deposit taking activities. To be clear, this is different from the credit disintermediation of the 90s and 2000s. The deintegration of banking services that is taking place now has its roots in technology, data, and operations, 
is it's affecting all banks, not just the large money center banks. My strong sense is that this process, if left to its own devices, is likely to accelerate and expand until there is a severe problem or even crisis. Like the globalization of manufacturing and disintermediation of credit, the efficiency gains of these changes can be enjoyed immediately, while the most material risks not manifest for some time. The first order of safety and soundness implications of this digitalization transition are in some ways obvious and have been the focus of supervisors for several years. In fact, over the last two decades, the OCC has adjusted its Bank Information Technology, or BIT, exams in response to tech innovations. For instance, in the mid 2000s, the OCC responded to advances in remote deposit capture and the expansion of mobile device usage in banking operations. Today, BIT exams include assessments of ransomware, AI, cloud computing, and DLT. Tech advances can offer greater efficiency to banks and their customers. The benefits of those efficiencies, however, are lost if a bank does not have an effective risk management framework. And the effect of substantial deficiencies can be devastating. BIT concerns in the national banking system are elevated. They currently constitute 25% of all cited supervisory concerns. The majority are related to fundamental elements of risk management. Of course, these are the known knowns. I worry increasingly about the unknowns and the non and, and concern that the less familiar risks of this digital transition are unlabeled and thus unseen. As we learned in the financial crisis, risks that are unseen have a tendency to grow and later to be the source of nasty surprises, which brings back to trust and faith. Banks have done a commendable job of rebuilding trust since the 2008 crisis. Their financial buffers and risk management capabilities have improved dramatically, notwithstanding trust is sensitive to surprise. And the evolution of bank fintech arrangements in the era of digitalization is giving rise to new opportunities for surprises. Fortunately, the risk can be mitigated. At the OCC, we are currently working on the process to subdivide bank fintech arrangements into cohorts with similar safety and soundness risk profiles and attributes. This will enable a clearer focus on risks and risk management expectations. To make real progress, however, a wide range of questions must be posed and answered. Who is responsible for what when things break? How might confidence be lost in, in this banking services supply chain disruption, and what would it take to regain it? How do banks and their third parties view and treat customers in bank fintech arrangements? When do customers go from being the client to becoming the product? And how are consumer protections maintained? How resilient are banking services to stress at fintechs? What happens when fintech uh, uh, fails? And how are bank and fintech business models changing? And how are those incompatibilities reconciled? This last point bears emphasis. When credit and liquidity risks in the banking system were disintermediated in the 90s, the mantra for the disruptors was, we're in the moving, not storing business. I heard this a lot when I was at the SEC. Banks stored risk, whereas security firms and other non-banks transformed and distributed it. The 08 financial crisis revealed that these business models were competing with each other, leading to a race to the bottom and providing incentives and opportunities for needless or passive complexity. Fast forward to today. The technology business model is very different from the banking business model. LTV CAC is different than it. What is the dynamic between these two business models? Do they lead to healthy competition, resulting in better products and services and more resilience at better prices for customers? Or do they lead to a race to the bottom and pressure to cut compliance corners and to monetize user data in novel ways? Perhaps both. In the lead up to the financial crisis, the failure to understand these dynamics between traditional and shadow banking created a massive blind spot for the industry and the regulatory community. At the OCC, we are actively working to eliminate such blind spots. A recently released five-year strategic plan explicitly acknowledges the digitalization forces that are at play and the need for us to be agile and credible in addressing them. We are building on the excellent work of staff over the last five years in the FinTech crypto space. We are also working closely with our interagency peers to help ensure that we have a shared understanding of how the financial system is evolving and that regulatory arbitrage and racism the bottom are minimized. Much work remains to be done. I sense that we are still in the early stages of a significant shift in how banking services are going to be provided in the future. By expanding our aperture, 
engaging more substantively with non-bank tech firms and mapping out bank fintech relationships and risk. We can help ensure that the banking system remains trusted and safe, sound, and fair as the system evolves. Let me turn now to the climate risk. The fiscal and transition risks associated with climate generate both safety and soundness challenges for banks. This is, there is urgent need for action. Shortly after my appointment, the OCC joined uh, NGFS and established a climate risk officer position. I'd like to emphasize several key developments since then. First, in December, we issued for comment principles for climate-related financial risk management for large banks. In the principles, we focused on risk management consistent with our mandate. We got a lot of comments. The majority of commenters generally supported the draft principles, while some warned of regulatory overreach. We are sifting through all this feedback as we determine next steps with our interagency colleagues. Second, in every meeting I have had with community banks over the past year, concerns about supervisory and regulatory actions related to climate change have been raised. I want to acknowledge those concerns and commit to continued open dialogue and constructive engagement as we move forward. In a couple of weeks, I'll be traveling to Lubbock and Midland, Texas to meet with local OCC supervised community banks and hear directly from them about the risks and issues impacting their communities. Third, two imperatives for large banks have become much clearer to me over the past year. The need for coordination and harmonization across jurisdictions, and the need to operationalize scenario analyses and to prioritize diverse approaches to such efforts over one size fits all stress tests. With regards to harmonization, my sense is that convergence by bank regulators on risk management expectations for large banks is achievable in the near medium term, both domestically and internationally. Data and metrics, on the other hand, are going to present more challenges. Among others, the EPSOC's uh, Climate-Related Financial Risk Committee is an excellent forum to help address those challenges. With regards to scenario analysis for larger banks, a strong emphasis on the diversity of approaches needs to be maintained, lest banks and regulators gravitate towards miniaturized, standardized stress tests. With climate-related risks, I believe we are much more exposed to failures of imagination not asking enough what-if questions than we are to failures of severity or consistency. Given the uncertain nature of climate-related risks today, probing for vulnerabilities under different scenarios will be more impactful <coughs> to climate-related risk management than generating comparable but overly stylized loss estimates. In short, I'm concerned that the muscle memory of capital stress testing is more likely to handicap climate scenario analysis than to have I believe a clean sheet of paper and an open mind to considering a wide range of risks and scenarios will yield richer and more actionable information than an approach that borrows heavily from stress testing. In addition to strengthening climate risk management and avoiding pitfalls, robust scenario analyses will help large banks seize opportunities as the economy, public policy, and behaviors change. As I noted before, the better a car's brakes, the faster you can safely drive it. Finally, one quick personnel note. In July, we posted for a new chief climate risk officer to replace the incumbent who retired. Our selectee, who we're very excited to announce in the coming weeks, will lead the OCC's new Office of Climate Risk, which elevates our internal function into a full-fledged office reporting directly to me. Let me say a quick, few quick words about uh, addressing inequality. Persistent economic inequality can erode trust in banking because those who feel stuck or lack access to traditional financial products and services they conclude that the system is working against them rather than for them. The OCC has been very active in taking steps to address inequality over the past year. Most importantly, we got the joint initiative to modernize the CRA back on track across the federal government agencies. Uh, many of was uh, released recently. We received hundreds of detailed and thoughtful comments and are now working closely with our interagency partners to review and evaluate the ideas and suggestions as we move forward with the rulemaking process. We've also focused on encouraging banks to reform their overdraft programs to make them more consumer friendly. It's expensive to be poor, and for some, overdrafts are a key and recurring expense. We've seen positive signs that many banks are getting the message. Banks are lowering penalty fees for overdrafts, reducing the daily maximum number of overdraft fees that are charged, adding a grace period or a buffer amount before fees kick in, or eliminating uh, NSF fees or overdraft transfer fees. Changes at the three national banks of the largest overdraft fee revenues could alone save consumers worth $2 billion annually. We hope that the positive changes made 
by these banks will inspire others to make similar pro-consumer changes to their overdraft programs. We continue to support the removal of structural barriers to financial inclusion through Project Reach, uh, where we convene leaders from banking, business, technology, uh, consumer groups, national civil rights organizations. Project Reach's work is divided into four national work streams, addressing affordable home ownership, inclusion for credit and visibles, revitalization of NDIs, and access to capital for small and minority businesses. Looking ahead, <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> I've, got, I've got double legs, apologies. <coughs> Looking ahead, in addition to, to continuing our efforts on each of these fronts, <coughs> we're going to focus on financial health to help us better develop approaches to evaluating and supporting consumer banking products and services. Additionally, uh, we will continue to focus on ensuring compliance with fair lending laws. It is simply not acceptable that redlining and other forms of lending discrimination continue in 2022. Let me turn to finally to the guardian of my place to say. Today, there are a range of mechanisms to help ensure large banks are adequately capitalized and well managed, stress testing, and standards. <coughs> These mechanisms are not foolproof, however. They can fail due to complacency. As the Orkago situation showed, a quote, lackadaisical attitude towards risk discipline can undermine good risk systems and cause unexpected losses. Maintaining strong risk management discipline is critical. I've tried to reinforce this in my remarks on tail risks, on the LIBOR transition, and in my meetings with bankers and risk managers. <clears throat> in addition to staying on top of novel, complex, and long-term risks, bank boards and senior managers need to ensure that they are covering the basics. Given the current rate outlook, mixed market, market signals, some of the liveliest discussions today should be taking place at ALCO and Credit uh, Committee recipients. Finally, let me say a quick word on bank mergers. I believe that the Bank Merger Act guidelines are ripe for updating. The OCC is working with our federal banking agency peers and the DOJ to review our bank merger frameworks consistent with President Biden's TO on promoting competition, as well as my own concerns about bank merger impacts on communities, the potential for institutions to become too big to manage, financial stability. As banks get larger, I am particularly focused on financial stability risks, given my experience in the crisis with two big fail firms. So in conclusion, to effectively safeguard trust in banking, we must maintain high fidelity to the concept of safety and soundness. We must champion fairness, and we need to be agile and credible as we adapt to changing circumstances. The recently issued OCC five-year strategic plan points us in this direction. Data tools, and accountability can help inform how best to implement the plan. We know from various sources that trust in banking fluctuates. For instance, according to the latest Gallup poll, trust in banking fell 6 percentage points from last year to 27%. In an FDIC survey, um, it's approximately a third of unbanked households cited that the reason for not having a bank account is that they did not trust banks. And there's many other studies out there. To better understand what lies behind these trends and headline numbers, I've asked staff to study existing surveys and develop a robust approach to systematically monitoring trust in banking. I believe an objective, well-designed survey that includes a number of measures of trust can help. The information will be informative for range of safety and assist us in developing actionable strategies to safeguard and hopefully increase trust in the banking system. Finally, before turning to Q&A, I want to say a word about the OCC staff. They are true unsung heroes. Their work is invisible to most, yet their impact is huge. They make ensuring the safety and soundness of two-thirds of the assets of the U.S. banking system today look easy. That's only because they're so good at it. I am proud to be a part of this agency to join such a dedicated public service in a mission focused on ensuring the safety, soundness, and fairness of the federal banking system. I cannot imagine a higher honor. Thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thank you, and uh, uh, that was great. I, I told him in the beginning I had a bunch of hard questions, and he said he was going to extend his remarks to. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 it's um, a well, highly true uh, tactic. Uh, for <laughs> it worked. It worked. Um, so we, we just have a few minutes, and if folks want to submit questions on the app, they certainly can. I, I have a few here. Um, you, you talked about the OCC having a, uh, a careful and 
cautious approach to digital assets. Um, and that started, I think, with the crypto sprint last year, which was fantastic. The uh, regulated banking community was very excited to see that, very excited to see some of the results that were announced at the end of last year. And it seemed like there was supposed to be a series of interagency guidance documents that would be coming out in early 2022 that would set forth supervisory expectations for banks that do want to engage in these activities. I, I think today that those guidance documents have not come out. And our understanding is that crypto sprint, maybe the interagency approach has slowed a little bit. Um, so I'm interested in if you could describe a little bit what the current process is, what, what, what the regulated community might expect in terms of forthcoming guidance. And, and then I want to follow up by asking about the SEC staff accounting bulletin 121. But just on the crypto sprint. I think you can probably guess how I'm going to answer the SEC question. Um, but let me start with the first question. I was hoping with my speech to, kind of, to, to not talk about crypto for five minutes, but it's impossible not to talk about crypto. So let's just jump right in. So I think a little bit of context helps. So last year, I believe the total market cap of crypto went from $1 trillion to $2 trillion in one month. Right? In the month of August or September, the industry was growing extremely rapidly. I mean, I think we all, all of us in this room can probably remember the first time you came across Bitcoin. Ah, yeah, it's a curiosity. And then it's like, okay, it's more than a curiosity. Let me try to learn what the heck a blockchain is. And then suddenly, every day, there's a new thing. There's a new client, there's a new business, there's a new platform being created. And so the sprint was designed to keep up with that. So the context of the sprint was, this industry was growing extremely rapidly. And there was a lot of intense curiosity and questions. We were getting lots of questions from banks about what's going on, what can they do, et cetera. You forward then to the spring, and then you've got the terror collapse. So now, this, and I think it's important to kind of walk through this, because with that terror collapse, you went from almost $3 trillion of total market value, I believe almost a trillion dollars was lost, in pretty, uh, according to how they count that, which is a whole other discussion. Um, but that came down quite a bit. And then suddenly you saw all of the hallmarks of a, of a classic run in the interconnected uh, industry that had problems. And you know, a lot of folks claimed, oh yeah, we saw this coming. No one said anything as the like, rocket ship was going up. So that all happened. And now the industry is kind of stuck at a trillion. I think now it's actually below a trillion. You know, uh, uh, Bitcoin is trading below 20,000. So this is a long-winded way of saying, we have time now. And I think what we have time is to get it right. So the interagency process continues. We're still engaging on the interagency process. We still want to make sure that the, the general uh, roadmap is the same. But now there's a little bit more breathing space to get that right. Uh, because we want to make sure that whatever gets done in the banking system is safe, sound, and fair. Again, I'm, just going, to, I'm going to be a broken record on this. If it can be safe, sound, and fair, it will happen. And we want it to happen. But it's got to be there. And for those who are in that industry, there are a lot of red flags on what's going on, so we're just proceeding carefully and caution. Would you generally agree with the proposition that the activities that are crypto adjacent or crypto related are, are more safely conducted inside the banking system than outside? Well, uh, so I, I would flip the question around and say that we as regulators would expect anything that comes uh, that is being done by the banks to be safe sense so almost by definition, whatever is done is going to be safe sense. Um, and so I think there are things that are more familiar to and then that's an, that's an important way of, uh, uh, it's a good, good starting point uh, to those activities. But you know, there is there's something that we as regulators do have to be conscious of. Crypto is a very hype driven thing. That, and, and I think even advocates within the industry would admit to that. And so there's a fine line for regulators to say, where are we drawing lines that are articulating safe sound, safety and soundness and fairness standards versus doing something that can be interpreted as promotion. I'm not here to promote or not promote anything. I'm here to establish where those, safe, where those guidelines are and to make sure everyone kind of follows them. Yep, yep. Well, certainly to the extent that if, if consumers want exposure to crypto assets, um, I think that if the banks think that they like to be able to provide that option to their customers rather than having their customers go to some unregulated, unaffiliated third party to get those products and services. Um, I guess but, one last thing. Yeah. So I, I think for those you know, institutions that really, really want do the back test against the Terra collapse. I think right now what you're seeing is that there are a lot of, uh, uh, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, go through Twitter and Reddit. I mean, if you go through this, these are, these are forums where there's a lot of noise. Like, I, I don't like the noise. But there's also a lot of stories there that are not reported in the mainstream financial press about 
users of these services. And it is not pretty. It is a really, it's pretty devastating how people have been hurt. And I think if you're an institution, imagine those are your clients. And they've used your service, and they've lost that money, and now they want to be made whole. What's your relationship? How does that back us to the range that you want to be in? And if you're good with that, that's great. But I think you just have to go in eyes wide open. And right now, like it's, it's, it is a buyer. The buyer beware disclaimer was slapped all over crypto going into it. And yet, people still felt scammed for those losses. And people thought, a lot of people thought, oh yeah, these platforms are FDIC insured. They're not. And yet, and that was, again, the disclaimers are there. So I think it just, Careful. Yeah, there's clearly a crazy part of crypto. I think I think the banks are talking about the, the, the more sort of reasonable sort of tested parts of it. Like for example, the banks want to provide custody services to institutional investors that want to have some exposure to crypto. But but in any event, on the SAV 141, so all the good work that the banking agencies are doing to set expectations about um, how banks should be engaging equities, it seems to be completely undermined by the SEC's decision to basically bring any crypto related or crypto, if you touch crypto in any way, you need to bring it on your balance sheet, uh, which seems wrong as maybe, maybe an accounting principle, but certainly as a matter of law, because if you custody crypto asset for someone, that does not make you the owner or the controller of the asset, you're, you, you, and you're not liable uh, to, 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 to the owner if something happens. But um, the, what, what are the OCC's views on the staff bulletin? Are you in discussions with the SEC? Because it currently, if it stands, it will be completely, you know, Inclusive for banks to engage in these activities given the credential framework and how the liquidity would have to be there. So I'm not going to comment on, on 721. Um, the, the, one, the one comment I'll make on custody custody for crypto is different than custody for other assets. Uh, if banks have been doing custody, traditional safety, for a really, really long time, banks are very good at it. They're, they're, they're all sorts of assets. Crypto assets are different, it involves keys. These keys are very different than what you traditionally have to handle for safeguarding purposes. And because blockchains are disintermediated, everything is direct, the role of the custodian is different with crypto than it is with securities. So these all require, it's not that it can't be solved, but it requires a lot of thought. And so just, again, we're, we're putting that thought into it you know, across the agencies. Um, and we're just, we just want to make sure we get this right uh, before kind of rushing in. And, and I think some securities are reported on the blockchain. So it's not, it's not without precedent for, for, for banks to, to be cussing assets that are, that are on the blockchain. But if I take your point. Can we pivot to, I guess, maybe to M&A, which is an area where, where you know, you have made a couple of speeches earlier this year, articulating some concerns about uh, M&A for, for banks above a certain asset size. Um, can you tell us, like, what your current thinking is on that? Um, has it evolved in any way? Um, and how do you think about the financial stability component of the bank in it? Sure. Uh, so it hasn't changed very much. Uh, uh, and I think if, if folks are more interested, I've given a couple of speeches on, uh, on this particular topic. If I can kind of boil it down. Uh, in the large bank space, I think a couple, again, contextual points. Um, in the crisis, the financial, the 2008 financial crisis, the, the, the largest banks were clearly heads and shoulders above everybody else. Uh, and the largest regional banks were not, by today's standards, that big. Just kind of you know, rough, rough benchmark. We go back and look at the data. You're in the two, 200, 300 million dollar range. And then uh, over time, you know, banking system continues to grow and evolve. And then by the time you get to um, 2155, the group of like Taylor, right? It's gotten, the, the, the big banks have gotten bigger and more complex, but the, again, the large regional haven't gotten that much bigger. Then you fast forward today, and it's a different story, right? I think the landscape has changed. Um, and the thing I worry about is that the, from a financial stability, financial stability perspective, often the, the way to ask that question is to say, well, uh, what are the financial stability impacts of you know, the, the, the systemicness of a particular bank's footprint? I think that needs to be layered with another question. Is what happens if that bank were to fail? Because that's, I think, the lived experience is that when a bank fails, you have to deal with it somehow. And for the vast majority of banks in the system, there's a really ready answer. Everyone's fine with that. That works really, really well. I just once you get up into a certain kind of size complexity, so, and for the GSIBs, there's an approach. And the approach has been now kind of worked through. It's internationally accepted. There's a strategy. Uh, some folks here in this room help kind of advise some key concepts of that. 
Whether it works or not, is a question. At least there's a, there's a very clear framework. But with the large regional it's not the case. I think, there's, sorry, I think the most likely outcome today of a large regional work to fail is that it will be sold to a visa. And that's not, I, I think we have to really pause on that outcome and say, like, well, is that, is that, is that a stable equilibrium for us or as a policy matter? Um, because look, we've all been in a situation where you've done the right thing to quote unquote save the financial system, but the political uh, uh, appetite to, to deal with those consequences is just not there. And that's why we've got that frame, that's why we've got Title One, that's why we have all these things. So why don't we take those ideas and concepts and see what applies um, in a targeted way? So this is not. Uh, if one were to accept the premise, and I don't think if not everybody would, but if one were to accept the premise that large regional banks in this country need some enhancements to their resolution capabilities, um, do, or do, is it your view that those enhancements must meet single point of entry in TLAC, or is there some other construct that might address the enhancements that, that you might be looking for? So it all, it's all going to depend. So I don't, I don't have uh, uh, kind of uh, prior hard set set stone views on what the right outcome is per se. I think those are good starting points because they're, they're out there. I think there's a lot of familiarity yourself and others about what that takes, how much it costs, et cetera, how to do it. So those are natural starting points. But if there's a better mousetrap, absolutely. Like if, if you'd be, I would be open to hearing what that better mousetrap is. Uh, and it should be tailored. You know, we, it, it should be uh, adjusted so it's appropriate and efficient and uh, uh, for the set of institutions. Yeah, I hear that as support for regulatory tailoring. Yes. Well, Well, um, not out of questions, but out of time. So I just want to thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. This is a community of bankers who, you know, operate under your supervision. I think they're grateful for your leadership and grateful that you came here today to your talks. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me.